Good morning. Happy Friday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right. We are squeezing this one in between mentorship calls this morning, so I'm going to dig right in. We got a neck question. This is kind of exciting. I haven't had one in a long time. Uh, it comes from Adrian, and Adrian says, I have an athlete with a great deal of neck limitation who appears to be very compressed in the upper ribs. Are there any good tests that can lead me toward a solution or let me know that I'm making progress short of trying to assess neck mobility directly? Uh, does compression of the manubrium affect neck position and movement? So this is actually a really, really, really good question. Um, Trying to assess neck mobility directly by, by hand can, can be somewhat unreliable. And if, if you're not a manual therapist and you're not constantly touching people, then it's difficult to, de to develop that feel. So it would behoove us to have some, some fairly reliable tests that would give us an idea of, of what might be influencing um, neck range of motion. And I, th and I think we do have a couple of really good ones. So uh, you asked about the manubrium. And there's a great way to test whether we have this, this um, mobility in, in the manubrium. So when we have a down pump handle, the manubrium is going to follow a little bit later in the compensatory sequence. And so an easy test to determine whether we have a down manubrium is actually the old school Apley scratch test. So this is where you reach behind your back and you try to touch the, uh, the opposite shoulder blade. And this is intra rotation behind, uh, behind the back and actually access this range of motion. We have to be able to eccentrically orient some of this anterior musculature. So if you think about if we're going to pick on a muscle, clavicular pack, for instance, would have to be able to eccentrically orient for us to reach behind our back and touch that opposite shoulder blade. So uh, if it's concentrically oriented and creating a compressive strategy that's pulling the manubrium down, you're not going to be able to reach behind your back. When we think about Another potential influence on, on the neck position, especially the lower cervical spine, we have to have dorsal rostral expansion to have normal rotation through the lower cervical spine. So our big test for that would be end range shoulder flexion. And so now we have two really powerful tests to let us know whether we're getting this anterior posterior expansion, especially in, in, the, in the upper rib cage. Now, from a strategy standpoint, we want to monitor these tests as we're, we're intervening to make sure that we're, we're on the right track. But um, the first thing that, that we want to look at is we're going to have differences in, in our wides and in our narrows. And so when we think about the compensatory sequence um, and, and how they arise, so if we're looking at a narrow, uh, we may still have some upper dorsal rostral expansion in, in many cases. So their inner range shoulder flexion might still be good, but they're not going to be able to reach behind their back. So in this case, um, we're still going to have some lower cervical rotation, but upper cervical rotation is going to be restricted. And so what you'll typically see is that typical forward head posture. We have an upper cervical extension, lower cervical flexion by traditional uh, representations. Hyoid bone um, will, will be depressed. If we're looking at a wide under the same situation, you're probably going to have dorsal rostral compression, again, based on the way that these compensatory sequences arise. Um, so in this case, we're going to have a limited amount of lower cervical rotation, but we're probably still going to have upper cervical rotation available to us. But this is going to be a more military style posture where you're going to see the, the, uh, the mandible uh, pulled, pulled backward actively, which is going to pull the hyoid uh, bone up. Now, as far as a treatment training strategy goes, first step. Let's not do anything that interferes. So we want to eliminate that. So bilateral symmetrical pressing activities tends to be a bad idea because it's just going to emphasize the, the compressive strategy that we may have um, that's pulling them, that manubrium down. If we have the, the dorsal rostral compression as well, then we want to take away symmetrical pulling activities, especially things like face pulls, I's, T's, and Y's. Because if it's already compressed, we don't want to emphasize more concentric orientation to drive more compression there. So when we go into the gym and we start to train these people, we're going to start thinking about for our wides, we're going to use like a high-low cable press. So we're going to play in this angle that would emphasize the, the inhalation capabilities um, as well as maybe some, some say, chopping activities. Um, to again promote this, this posterior expansion. Once we can recapture that posterior expansion, now we can start to, to work on, on a little bit more of our reaching activities at 90 degrees and start to emphasize that anterior expansion. For the narrows, we're just going to reverse the process. We're going to start somewhere in this, in this, like I said, 90 degree shoulder flexion reaching activities, and then we're going to try to expand that, that posterior aspect of the thorax. So, 
Adrian, I hope this gives you some ideas to work with. Um, you've got a couple of tests that you can follow. You've got some strategy um, as well as a representation of probably what you're looking at. So if you have any other questions, please let me know at askbillhartman at gmail.com. Askbillhartman at gmail.com. Have a great Friday. Have an outstanding weekend. And I'll see you next week.